Welcome to the U.S. Healthcare System Lecture Series by Monica Wahi. Based on Essentials of the U.S. Healthcare System by Shi and Singh. This next lecture is a combined lecture. It combines Chapter 5, which is over technology and its effects, with Chapter 11, which covers healthcare needs for special populations. The reason why I combine these lectures is most of the time we talk about technology as being very expensive, maybe a waste of money, and possibly misapplied. However, I have a vision. I believe we can use that technology wisely to help people in special populations. That's why I combine this lecture today, and I hope you enjoy it. Chapter 5, Technology and Its Effects along with Chapter 11, Populations with Special Health Needs. Learning Objectives. At the end of this lecture, the student should be able to explain at least two ways in which technology can be used to improve access to care for a special population. Students should also be able to describe at least three considerations that should be taken into account when trying to minimize the cost and maximize the benefit of medical technology. Finally, the student should be able to describe at least one special population, what special needs it has, and what the healthcare system must consider in meeting those needs. We will start by covering Chapter 5, The Impact of Medical Technology. There are many benefits of modern technology. First of all, look at that beautiful glass building. A lot of big glassy buildings have been built fairly recently within the last 10 years. I even worked at one when I worked at an Alzheimer's Institute. It was wonderful to be part of a team of people building a beautiful big glassy building. So that's one of the benefits of modern technology. Also, you have improved diagnosis and treatments. For example, cancer. Cancer used to always be a death sentence, but now we improve diagnosis. We are able to diagnose many cancers a lot earlier and therefore treat them and make them go away. Isn't that wonderful? We've also improved sanitation, nutrition, and living conditions. We found better ways to keep ourselves and our environment clean. We found better things to eat, and we found better ways to live. Life expectancy in the United States almost doubled from 1900 to 1965, and that was a collusion between public health and medicine. Research and development has led to these advances. Modern technology in the United States looks like the seesaw. On one side, the right side, you have technology growth. You have electronic medical records, you have more technologic procedures like MRIs, you have more fancy diagnostics and treatments that are technological like robotic arms and surgery and all kinds of new um, tests that can be done by pathologists. So the reason why the seesaw is leaning is because it's expensive to do all that and there's been a whole lot more of that than what's on the left side of the seesaw, which is cost containment. The market has just gone crazy. As we wanted EMRs, people made them, and now there are many companies. Some are great, some are not so great, but everybody's buying. People made more MRI machines when they realized they could sell them. People made more diagnostic equipment, more treatments. And there have just been few controls on that cost containment. So as people have wanted the technology that has grown, it has been purchased. There is such thing though as too much technology. Canada knows about this, so they employ supply side rationing. For example, they limit the number of MRI machines in a particular area. They just make it so everybody can get to at least one if they need one. In the US market, it's the market that takes care of deciding how many MRI machines need to exist and where they need to be. And consumer expectations must be met. If consumers, consumers are upset because they cannot access an MRI machine, the U.S. market does have to take care of that. 
In the U.S., we offer specialized procedures in outpatient, and so therefore people can access them. And medical training is more complicated. There are a lot of the pressures, but these specific ones equal excessive equipment and treatment, increasing cost. So therefore in the U.S., there is too much technology in healthcare. Let's look at some examples of medical technology. You have three basic categories here on this slide, medical procedures, diagnostic equipment, and equipment devices to render treatment. When you look at medical procedures, you can think of wonderful things that have improved, such as open heart surgery, tissue transplants, hip and knee replacements, and other sorts of ways that we have found to, for example, take care of our veterans who have been injured in war. We found a lot of ways to attach prosthetics and we help them regain function. This is wonderful. We also have more diagnostic equipment and the reason why it's so big on the right side of the slide, this label CT and MRI, is because it literally is big. We're all going for those CTs and those MRIs and they're really helping us. They're allowing clinicians to see inside us without having to invade us and therefore keeping us healthy and giving them the information they need to know to diagnose us. Equipment devices to render treatment involve all kinds of neat stuff, all kinds of machines. We have new machines to deliver all kinds of treatments and so therefore our curative medicine is going nuts. However, every time you invent a new kind of technology and it's available, you invent a new host of ethical questions. For example, look at this. If you save very premature babies, which is a wonderful thing to do, you now have uh, ethical issues of what to do with these babies, right? How are they going to develop outside the womb? There's so little. Are they going to develop? What are their long-term outcomes? As we keep in kept people older longer, we now have more end-of-life issues. We have informed consent issues about people receiving treatments or entering research. And then there is, of course, the ongoing nagging questions of rationing health care. Many ethical dilemmas come with the availability of these wonderful treatments due to technology. Medical technology and information technology. There are many examples of medical technology and these two next slides will cover a few. These are facilities and organizational systems. So in other words, large groups have to do this. Those large groups are often, you guessed it, our old friends, the MCOs and the IDSs. So let's look at the left side of the slide. Medical centers and systems. Think about the last time you were at a medical center if you could afford to go to one. They had computers everywhere. There are computers at the front desk where you have to ask in some sort of HIPAA compliant way about your friend who might be in the emergency room. And this person then looks things up and says in some HIPAA compliant way what to do next. And of course, then you walk around the hospital and maybe you see displays on the wall. You see all different kinds of things medical centers and systems put in information technology. You also have laboratories. Those are more behind the scenes. If you can imagine old-fashioned labs, they had these machines that would run assays and make printouts that kind of look like receipts. Now you have that all digitized. It's going directly into computers and that those computers are sometimes even connected to your medical record and sometimes those are connected to something online where you can log in and see your lab values. We have managed care networks as I mentioned and those networks are highly computerized. They take in all the insurance information and they even analyze it. They try to figure out better ways to deliver care in an optimal way so everybody gets the care they need and it doesn't cost too much. Everybody is implementing information systems and trying to get them to work together and they're trying to use them to improve patient care management. For instance, electronic medical record systems are tried to be 
they're trying to program them so that they flag medical errors. For instance, if you prescribe a patient two different drugs that the patient should not take together, or if the patient is missing important follow-up. And so as you can see, facilities and organizational systems are needed to implement this medical technology in an optimal way. In addition, these organizational systems can use the internet. The internet is just out there, why not use it? Now hospital systems and uh, IDSs are publishing, publishing more information about themselves. They are publishing simply directions on how to get there as well as outcomes for going to their places. They are using the internet to communicate with patients. They are doing e-health. And now, as more and more laws are made, creating the availability of this, there is more telemedicine. There are more people in remote areas being able to access both generalists and specialists via the internet or phone or remote methods. This, of course, leads to distance education. If you are watching this online, then you can see that this is a great example of distance health education. Finally, we have electronic medical records, which I keep bringing up because they're so important. We've spent a lot of money on them, and they can be very powerful. Like I mentioned earlier, they can flag medication errors, but better yet, they can do all kinds of things. They can create databases that people like me can mine and try to find better ways of keeping people healthy. There are several major categories of medical technology. Let's talk about these categories. First, you have clinical information systems. Then you have administrative information systems. You have internet and e-health applications and decision support systems. They all kind of sound the same, so I put an example on the slide of each so you can understand what the differences are. So an example of a clinical information system is a computerized physician order entry system. So imagine you go to the doctor and the doctor decides to order you a drug. And instead of the doctor pulling out his or her prescription pad and scribbling on it, which is something that you can't read and you wonder if the pharmacist can, instead that physician turns to the internet and logs into a secure portal and asks you where you go to your pharmacy and simply order enters the pharmacy request. You can imagine how this gets easy then because the physician can use drop down boxes and make sure he or she prescribes the right medication. I even had a friend who is my physician prescribe a medication for me in an emergency and he got it wrong because he was scribbling on a pad. It's hard to remember all these different drugs and computerized physician order entry systems can be programmed so that they are clear communication and they also prevent mistakes. Administrative information systems, one example of that would be the payroll system, another a billing system, staff scheduling systems and budget co and cost control systems. When we think about healthcare and databases and data, we often think about electronic medical records or things like prescriptions. We often forget that there could be a lot to be learned about staff scheduling, about from billing records, from looking at payroll records, those things can be used for the thing in the purple section, which is decision support systems, where you can make forecasts, alerts, predictions, and suggestions based on mining a lot of that data. In the green portion, you'll see internet and e-health applications, and those have to do with virtual visits and patient portals. Like I mentioned earlier, if you can go and log in online and get your laboratory results, that solves the problem of your outpatient clinic trying to get you that information, which you used to have to make another appointment with the doctor to find out. Now you can just log in and look at it online. It's almost like a virtual visit. All of these are implementations of medical or health informatics. Now let's see how these could be implemented in different settings. 
Retail health clinics include minute clinics, or places where you can go to normally a place that's known as a pharmacy and actually see health care providers for routine care. You can pay out of pocket and sometimes they even take insurance. One of the big challenges in retail health clinics is the fact that they don't have your medical records like your regular primary care doctor or hospital does. So one thing that could be used is we could have retail health clinics be able to electronically access your records if they need them. Now let's think of a way that we could implement technology in pharmacy to make that better. Well, we already talked about computerized physician order entry, but perhaps pharmacy could go further. I downloaded a pharmacy app from a local pharmacy. It is an independent one. It is not CVS or part of any big chain. This independent pharmacy had an app that they had, a simple app, so that now when I go to them, I can reorder my prescriptions. That is a simple way for that small neighborhood pharmacy to keep me as a customer. We have military treatment facilities. The military is a very mobile unit of our government. The people in it are moving around all the time. They live in different places and sometimes overseas. How can we make sure that they constantly get the quality care that they need and moreover they deserve? How can we make sure they are always taken care of? Well, there are a lot of ways that technology can be used to monitor the health of our soldiers, for example. I've been to seminars where they talk about developing things where there are sensors on people. Sensors that maybe pick up whether their head has been jarred to the point that they might have a head injury, so as people could run out and take care of them. Sensors on their clothing where the, it can, might, might be able to figure out if they're becoming too cold or too hot or dehydrated. There are wonderful things being developed by the military that will help the military and may even help civilians, and they are in the realm of medical technology. Home health can get less complicated with medical technology. Remember the app I just told you about? That pharmacy caters to home health providers. Home health providers often need unusual formulations of pharmaceuticals. And so therefore, that app could very much help those home health providers who sometimes need, in an emergency, to ask for something unusual to be prepared. In addition, like with the rural health clinics, home health can better interface with electronic medical records. Just think of how simple it is now to bring a laptop into somebody else's home, connect to the internet securely, and log into a medical record. People in home health could help primary care doctors and specialists stay up to date about their patients that they're caring for. In the emergency room, things are very hectic. People come in and the people who work in the emergency room have often never seen them before. These people normally are seen by their primary care docs or once in a while specialists, but hopefully they're rarely seen in the emergency room. The emergency room really needs good technology to be able to access healthcare records quickly. Also, it needs quick access to quickly done tests. In the emergency room, if you get in a car accident, they will quickly do a bunch of imaging. Well, what good is that imaging if it can't get to the doctors who need to see the image and interpret it? The emergency room really does benefit from the right applications of medical technology. Finally, you have prisons. Prison health care is a big challenge. It's hard to get health care to prisoners. It's very hard to put these people in handcuffs and get them all surrounded and transported to a hospital where they can get the care that they need. Sometimes that care doesn't need to happen in a hospital or a clinic. It can happen remotely, especially mental health care. Remember what I said about our prison population. A high proportion of it has serious mental health problems, and they really need some treatment. They're suffering, even in prison. They're suffering more than they need to. So think about ways that telehealth can help them. People can give them services people who are social workers, are therapists, and these therapists can be safe. 
if the prisoner gets angry, the therapist is not there in person, and therefore they can't get hurt. There are many great applications of telehealth in prisons. There are a lot of strategies in medical informatics. Let's start at the bottom of this pyramid and talk about electronic health records. These are the collection and storage of health information, that, and it can allow immediate access for authorized users. So for instance, the example I gave about people getting scans, well, we know that the technicians who do ultrasounds and MRIs and CTs are not the same people who actually read them, and sometimes those are not even the same people who actually end up taking the information to the patient about what to do. So all of those users who can be authorized to see that patient's information can have immediate access by way of a computer through electronic health records. Knowledge allows for decision support, meaning that if you have to make a decision, whether it be about budgeting or about what to do with a patient, you ha if the more knowledge you have, the better decision you'll make. So the better quality your decision will be, whether it's giving quality care or making a quality budget, and of course the cost will always be lower. And this, of course, will increase the efficiency in healthcare delivery. This is the vision behind electronic health records. This is why they should decrease decrease costs and, and increase quality health care delivery. In a 2002 survey, half of all Americans looked for health information online. So the internet is playing a big role in health and as well as e-health applications on the internet. And in an AMA survey, 86% of U.S. physicians said that they use the internet to obtain medical and prescription drug information. I would not be surprised if that number has gone up to 100% simply because a lot of hospitals and healthcare organizations, IDSs, purposefully put their information on the internet and expect their workers to go there as well as sometimes the public. Because they create patient gateways, like I was describing where you can easily get your lab results if you log in. Often on these hospital web pages where providers can log in, patients can log in as well. The last strategy I'm going to talk about is telemedicine and remote services. This is a way to provide diagnosis and treatment when a provider and patient are separated at a far distance and it would be hard for one to get to the other. Unfortunately, this has had a very slow adoption, except in the realm of diagnostic or consulta consultative teleradiology. For example, a lot of times people can take scans and give them to a radiologist somewhere very far away and the radiologist can read them and send the information back. People haven't had any problem with that and they have also haven't had any problem with sending things like laboratory results to a remote pathologist to receive a diagnosis back. However, there has been a slow adoption of trying a lot of other things. A lot of the remote health services that can be given uh, are not being given right now largely because of laws. If you have ever accessed mental health services and had to sit with a therapist for an hour, um, wouldn't you rather to just stay home and do that or in your office? Well, that is a vision for telemedicine implementation in mental health. It seems like a very realistic thing to do. Let's talk about the criteria for quality of care. These criteria are in operation for all health care. However, when we go to implement information technology and especially telemedicine into care, we have to make sure we look at these benchmarks of quality. If we're going to implement technology, we have to ask, does it actually prevent or delay disease onset? Mammograms are a good example because we deploy that technology we can say that it actually del delays disease onset in a sense because we can catch cancers earlier and get rid of them. The next question we have to ask in terms of quality of care is is this implementation going to give us a more accurate diagnosis? Sometimes we have fancy scans like for example I talk a lot about MRIs they're very useful However, they found also a way to 
modify MRI machines so that they can not only monitor what they monitor now, but they can look at blood flow in the brain. They pr produce beautiful images of blood flow in the brain and it becomes very interesting for research. However, so far, this area of technology, which is called functional MRI or fMRI, hasn't really been shown to diagnose much of anything. So therefore, modifying your MRI machine to add an F to it, to do fMRI, would not aid in a more accurate diagnosis. It's really just for research right now. Moving on with quality of care benchmarks, we have to be looking for a quicker cure. Does the application of this technology cause a quicker cure? So, for example, does somebody who have, has surgery with a robotic arm get better quicker than somebody who has it with an actual surgeon? Well, it might be possible to do it that way because it might be more sterile, or there may be ways that the robotic arm can be more precise than an actual human. So this is possible. We need to ask ourselves, does it meet the benchmark of more complete care? In other words, does information technology or the application of e-health or any sort of technology cause a person to have their care more completed? A great example would be with maybe managing diabetes. If you are unfortunate enough to receive a type 2 diabetes diagnosis, you suddenly realize you've entered a world where you have to change your lifestyle. You have to suddenly learn a whole heck of a lot about glucose metabolism and what you can eat. And you also have to learn about what you have to prevent because now you're at high risk for so many different bad consequences. So more complete care could be given to you if you unfortunately receive that diagnosis by using information technology. You can get more health education about what to eat. You can get consultation with nurses and doctors by telephone or by Skype about what to do or whether you're having symptoms, helping you with your glucose management. So you can see how information technology could give a person more complete care. And you would like to see it increase the safety of the treatment, like for example that I gave with the robotic arm, or a properly installed order entry system can prevent medication errors. You would also like to see the application of technology minimize side effects. Side effects are bad things, and they come from a lot of different drugs. One of the things we can do is study the data that comes out of healthcare as to who reacts to what, and maybe we can apply technology then to minimize side effects. We want technology to help people recover faster from surgery. We've developed technology that allows people to go home sooner and do home health. That helps them recover faster often, so that's one good application. Further, we want to increase average life expectancy in the United States, and technology is one way to do it, especially assistive devices. Anything that can help people stay mobile and independent longer as they age will increase their life expectancy. And finally, at the end of the day, we need to increase quality of life in our population. We don't want to just increase medical care or access to medical care. We want that medical care to be effective in increasing quality of life. How could health IT on the devil side mess all of these benchmarks up? On the angel side, how could health IT improve these? I talked about how it could improve these because I'm trying to be optimistic. But if you've ever worked anywhere that has ever tried to implement any technology, you have probably seen the devil side. There are many challenges for health IT. The biggest one, perhaps, is privacy and confidentiality. And maybe this has been the biggest barrier to adoption, especially over the internet. For the longest time, we have had Facebook, but only recently do we have easily accessible patient gateways, and not everywhere. Interoperability, especially in the United States, is a huge deal. What that means is electronic medical records here are not accepted as in the electronic forum over there because everybody gets to buy their own version. Whereas in the VA system, they have the VISTA system that they built, which everyone complains about, but it works pretty well 
and of course it's interoperable and so they can all work together. That's like the national health care systems information systems in for instance Britain. There are regulations and laws that have to be changed to accommodate health IT and you have to do it in such a way as to maintain those quality of care benchmarks. This requires research, and sometimes that research is hard to do. At the end of the day, technology is always expensive, but it doesn't matter if you get a return on investment. People who decide to install expensive solar panels on their house justify it by saying that in the long run, they'll save much more than they paid to install the solar panels on electricity. So in the long run, we want to install this medical technology and apply it and save money, but we don't want that long run to be so long that the medical, medical technology we applied expires or becomes obsolete before we meet the return on investment. So what are the appropriate functions for setting when that is? What is the long run? There's a lot of market pressure from industry to buy a lot of really good, cool, EMRs and do all kinds of technology and also we can't just blame industry. Let's face it, patients expect it. We want to log into patient gateways. We want costs, uh, we want and we don't want to pay the cost of functionalities but right now our insurance is paying it so don't, we don't really know about it. At the end of the day, as I have resonated, good management is the key to seeing and ROI from health IT and medical informatics. You can do little tests with demo versions of your EMR or small implementations to see how much should you really spend because how much can you really save and then your long run doesn't have to be so long. Let's just think about what I said. Who has expertise in management? And who has expertise in informatics? Nurses. You're a big part of the workforce. Why don't you step in? Let's move on to talk about cost and cost saving in medical technology. Let's first talk about what drives up costs. First of all, there are high capital costs. This literally means it not only costs a lot to buy an MRI machine, but it also costs a lot to, buy, to set up a facility where you can put the machine and put people in it. And that's just an MRI machine. Imagine what you have to buy in terms of servers and such, and of course help when setting up an EMR. You need research and development, and you need precision manufacturing for, for example, robotic arms and surgery. You need training and special skills. I know somebody who used a gamma ray he would use this gamma ray on people's tumors in their head. He was highly trained. It was a very difficult job. You had to be perfect at it. He was an amazing guy. But man, he had a lot of special skills. And I'm sure that gamma ray machine was pretty expensive. And I'm sure when they installed it there, the facilities have required refurbishing. Where oftentimes you have to set up a situation where there are barriers so that certain nu nuclear radioactive things don't get out. You have to set up privacy areas. And higher utilization of these special technologies happens when it's covered by insurance as I explained earlier because I as a patient don't have to pay out of pocket so I really don't know how much some of this fancy stuff is costing. There's a moral hazard there, which I cover in future lectures, from the provider-induced demand. But there are things that also can drive down cost in medical technology, and let's look at those. Let's think about it. Some of the earlier procedures were more expensive, and we can kind of get a ballpark estimate by remembering that it, we used to have to be inpatient for a lot longer for surgeries, and being inpatient is costly. Now, minimally invasive procedures eliminate the need for overnight hospital stays, and a lot of them can be done outpatient. And there are technologies that, if unfortunately you do need to be admitted, shorten hospital stays. 
So you can see that technology can drive down costs substantially. Let's get back to the return on investment in healthcare. There are three parts of it. You have efficacy, safety, and cost effectiveness. And a health technology assessment is necessary or you can't tell if you're doing that. So if you put in any sort of health technology, you have to see if it's efficacious. Now that you put it in, are you delivering care to your patients that is equal or better than the standard of care? Look at those quality benchmarks. Are the intended results achieved? For example, if you had scheduling issues and you put in an EMR, are those scheduling issues resolved? If they're not, what's going on? You also have to consider safety. Did your EMR break things that were working before? Sometimes, especially in small clinics, things worked easier by just simply yelling across the room. If you put in an EMR and you expect people to be updating it and they're not, it's probably better to be yelling across the room where everybody can hear. If you put in some technology, did it introduce new errors? Just like with anything online, when you go to fill out a form, an electronic form, sometimes drop-down boxes are already defaulting to certain variables. Sometimes certain things are already filled in for you. If those aren't correct and you don't notice and you click submit, that's error. Are there new errors because of your medical technology? The assessment is necessary to answer that question. Finally, especially in terms of ROI, you've got to look at cost effectiveness. Did your implementation save money anywhere in the system? Not just maybe where you intended to save money, but does it save money anywhere else? Was there any sort of domino effect? Remember, each of these is a natural experiment. And if it did save money, quantify it. How much? Because that's how you're going to figure out when you get your ROI. So let's think about it. Have you ever worked somewhere? anywhere, but especially in healthcare, or received care somewhere where they added technology and you were pretty sure it made things worse? I know I just simply remember trying to buy a new t set of tires for my car and going to the store and their computer had crashed and so I couldn't buy $80 worth of tires. And that wasn't even healthcare technology. That was private industry. And look, they lost a sale. So think about it. They added some sort of new database that didn't work. What if we did that in healthcare? You could see how it could become less safe. What if the computer crashes at the hospital? What if something new is more expensive and therefore fewer people can have it? What if it's more error prone? If managers actually did a health ex a technology assessment of how all the above went, in some sort of implementations that you've known about, what do you think they would find? Do you know why managers tend to avoid doing these health technology assessments? It's because the answer is there's a lot of surprises and some of them are negative. I'm very good at implementing technology. I work very hard to try and make it perfect. And you know what? I make mistakes. There are unintended consequences. But I find out because I do a health technology assessment. Imagine I was a person who simply didn't know what I was doing. I would look a lot like the leaders in healthcare right now who are implementing technology. They don't even know what ROI stands for sometimes. And so therefore, they don't even know how to do a health technology assessment. And even if they did, they know it would bring about way more bad news than mine always does because I actually know what I'm doing. So guess what? They don't get done. In the end, good management is the key to seeing an ROI from health IT or medical informatics. And as an added side note, nursing has been known to excel in management in health IT and informatics. And as I mentioned before, nurses might be called to step in where physicians can't handle everything right now with the expanded access to care under the Affordable Care Act. 
so maybe there is a role for nursing here. There are many ways that health IT can improve the U.S. healthcare system. It can improve operations. It can make things easier. It can make it easier for patients to get the information they need and move through the healthcare system. It can improve safety, and I've given several examples of how it can do that. It can also contain cost. In fact, just simply calculating an ROI and trying to get it when you implement new information technology in medical care would help to contain cost. And it would also help to optimize care and value. We can apply technology to make care better. We can do it to make care more standard. If you've ever seen studies of differences across the United States or between different races of people in the same area of the United States who have the same di diagnosis, you would be kind of horrified because you'd see that there are classes of people who don't get standard care. They get really bad care and it's like hard to make it equal. Remember Healthy People 2020? Remember health equities? Well, one way is to use technology to try and standardize that care and as well improve access to care, which is one thing that's really important, especially for special populations. With all this positive energy behind it, why has health IT not lived up to its promise so far? Well, there's many reasons. There's a lot of challenges in health IT that you don't see in, for example, banking or other places. There's a cost in making and implementing laws and regulations. The FDA has to take a look at things. States have to make state level laws. And all that costs money and takes time away from making other laws or taking care of other problems in the population. Also, competitions from providers drives up cost. We do have a lot of market justice going on out there, and we as patients really like it when our clinicians have good medical technology. So, of course, we want those providers, but then we won't have to find a way to pay for it. And medical training and research create demand. The more fancier our technology gets, the more we have to train people to use it, and the more we re have to research more technology, and then there's more demand. American customers demand and insurance supplies. That's how it works here. So far, the market justice and social justice combination of pressures make it so that if American customers are covered by insurance, they usually can get whatever fancy technology is available. ROI is not demonstrated for a variety of reasons, and this was these were just a few on this slide. In the conclusion of this first part of the lecture, technology can have good or bad effects on the U.S. healthcare system, and it's really depending on how it's implemented. So if you are careful about your implementation, you get the good effects, and if you don't know what you're doing, you usually get the bad effects. And what's worse is if you don't know what you're doing, you don't study the after effects, so you don't know that you got the bad effects. Not only is it important to plan for an ROI when implementing new health technology, but also to do the health technology assessment after implementing it. Remember, you can fix things after the fact, and you certainly have an obligation to. Good management is the key to seeing an ROI from health IT and medical informatics. Conversely, bad management is the key to wasting money and putting patients in danger. Now we will move on to the second part of this lecture, which is Chapter 11, Populations with Special Health Needs. Let's see if we can apply good health information technology and medical technology to these people. Predisposing, enabling, and need characteristics are ways of looking at vulnerability. These are ways of grouping areas of vulnerability together and thinking about so let's start with looking at predisposing characteristics. These are, for example, racial and ethnic characteristics, or gender and age, geographic location. So these are characteristics that people may have that predisposes them to certain levels of vulnerability. Next you have enabling characteristics, and that includes 
insurance status, and cut off in the lower part of the slide, homelessness. So these are situations where these things can enable vulnerability. They cause vulnerability. Finally, you have needs characteristics. People who have more needs, therefore, are more vulnerable. People with chronic illnesses, disabilities, HIV and AIDS, and of course, mental health issues. If you don't need as much health care, you're not as vulnerable. Notice how all of these things pile up. For example, a homeless person may be, well, is more likely to be very young in age in terms of a predisposing characteristic, and they're also more likely to have mental health issues, a big need characteristic. Let's look more at predisposing characteristics. Let's look at the predisposing characteristic of race ethnicity. That doesn't seem very fair, does it? There are disparities. What does disparities mean? It means a disproportionate amount compared to white people. It doesn't mean differences. Because if there were disparities between, for example, blacks and whites, which there are when it comes to infant mortality, simply making more white babies die would close the disparity and then they would be equal. But that would be horrible. What we want to do is save more black babies' lives. So forget about disparities for a second and talk about trying to make other races and ethnicities that are not white meet up with whites because they all seem to have the best outcomes. When we're talking about health outcomes like life expectancy. And then we also have to look at enabling characteristics. So if you look at certain races and ethnicities, they'll have maybe less access to health care or lower level of literacy, especially in the English language. These enabling characteristics do not need to be there complicating the situation. We can try to get rid of those and then we can try to get rid of disparities that way. How does race and ethnicity lead to such disparities? Well, there's a lot of collusion of factors. You have many environmental stressors. First you get racism. Racism leads to trouble with employment and poverty. Then you've got poor food quality if you live in an area that's impoverished. Remember, some places you just can't get fresh fruit and vegetable very easily. If you're working three jobs, you have lack of time to exercise, and you certainly could be in a stressful life circumstance. All of these things can collude to put together and end up being a, a situation where a racial or, racial or ethnic community experiences disparities in health outcomes. There's rarely a biological relationship. Like African Americans, certain DNA in African Americans is linked to sickle cell trait. But beyond things like that, there's not really a biological relationship between why certain races and ethnicities have worse health outcomes. Once in a while you bump into one. The main thing is these collusion of environmental stressors that seem to turn on any sort of bad genes a person would have. Remember, stress really contributes to mental health problems and mental health problems really contribute to physical health problems and racism's pretty darn stressful and so is poverty. Let's look some more at some different predisposing characteristics. Let's start with women and children. Women, who make up more than half the population, have a higher rate of mental illness than men. This could be attributed to stress from sexism, lower pay, and other environmental sources. And there are now new emerging morbidities or sicknesses for children. Children at younger ages are getting drug and alcohol addicted. And of course, we have this horrible monster of obesity and type 2 diabetes attacking our children. And with all the school shootings recently, we see that children are having mental health problems and we still have the age-old problem of dealing with learning disabilities. 
So women and children have high rates of predisposing characteristics in those sense. Now let's look at the right side of the slide. The GLBT population is not mentioned in the text, but they're a very important group. For example, GLBT kids have an extremely high adolescent suicide rate. Only recently have, has the GLBT population achieved a measure of civil rights, um, but still, for example, it is illegal in many places in the United States for same-sex marriage. And, of course, there is still much medical discrimination against transgendered individuals. These people often can't even access bathrooms, much less health care services. There are unique health needs for these people. There are age-old stories that lesbians will tell about being harped on about birth control when they're having sex with women and therefore don't have any risk of becoming pregnant. What about gay men and HIV? Don't they have unique health needs? Isn't, aren't there unique things that need to be done to help protect this population? These are other predisposing characteristics. Talking more about vulnerability, let's talk about rural health. Rural residents earn, on average, around $7,000 less than urban residents. Okay, so they're poorer. And 24% of rural children actually live in poverty. So if you're in a rural area, one in four children are likely to be impoverished. That seems like a very high rate. 20% of the U.S. population lives in the rural areas, which is not very big, but only 10% of our physicians are based there. Remember the geographic maldistribution? Although the rural areas are gorgeous, as you can see by this picture, they unfortunately suffer for increased burden of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, mental health disorders, tobacco use, substance abuse, Remember what I said about poverty, if there's a high level of poverty and stress, you can see an increase in these kind of medical problems. How could medical technology reduce disparities in these groups? Remember how I talked about racial and ethnic groups? How could we use technology to improve, for example, literacy or health literacy, or maybe bring them out of poverty? We see now a lot of accredited online universities. That can help. Women and children. Can we give them access to mental health services using telehealth? Is there a way we can deploy the internet or health apps to help with the child obesity problem? GLPT groups can <coughs> use the internet to connect with each other. Maybe we can prevent adolescent suicide. Look up the It Gets Better project. That's a great example of how the internet has been used to try and reach out to GLBT youth. And there are ways that the internet can be used and other medical technology can be used to address the unique health care needs of the GLBT population. And again, thinking about that 20% of the U.S. that lives in the rural health area, how can we use teletechnology um, and medical technology, how can we apply it in such a way to reduce their horrible burden of such disease and to reduce costs and increase access? One of the golden ways that technology has been deployed in the rural areas is to help with mental health access. First of all, even if there was a mental health clinic in the rural area, because not many people live there, if a person goes there, another person can see them, and pretty much everybody knows everybody, and they don't really want each other in their business. If they can access mental health services from home, it's more amenable to them. Nobody has to know, and therefore more people are likely to access it. Let's now move on to enabling characteristics. Enabling characteristics from the text include being uninsured and also being homeless. Of course, as I reiterate, in the U.S. healthcare system, if you do not have insurance, you really don't have access to care. So the uninsured always tend to be younger because we have Medicare to 
to insure those who are 65 and older in the U.S. The uninsured are more likely to be a racial or ethnic minority for the variety of reasons I just stated. The estimated amount of emergency room uncompensated care cost $31 billion in 2009. Those were people who did not have money for regular health care and probably did not have insurance and therefore waited until they got so sick they had to go to the emergency room and at the end of the day nobody paid. These uninsured people have low access to care. Let's think about now the homeless. 1% of the U.S. is homeless each year. That seems like a lot of people. 40% of homeless men are veterans. That seems pretty unfair, doesn't it? 26% of homeless have severe mental illness, but really only 5-7% to require institutionalization. So that whole other 20% could just be living in apartments or whatever and having a life if they just had care for their mental illness. There's high rates of mental health problems in the homeless and of course acute and chronic medical problems. There's high rates of substance abuse and of both assault and victimization. And of course the homeless live outside. They suffer the effects of weather. And so you can see the power of that enabling characteristic of homelessness in making one vulnerable. Here are some more enabling characteristics. On the left side of the slide, we look at migrant status. If one is a migrant, continuity of care is difficult. Even if one might trust the care, how does one get care when one is moving from place to place? Like with the homeless people, the migrants have exposure to harsh environments. Of course the weather, but also sometimes pesticides and other things. There are immigration health issues and occupational issues. Possible language barriers. These people have a lot of trouble getting insurance, even if they just are migrants and maybe they are US citizens. Maybe they were born on our soil. It becomes often difficult for them to get through the complicated US healthcare system, not unlike everyone else. However, being undocumented leads to a fear of accessing health care. So even children born here of undocumented people may go without health care because that fear is very palpable. On the right side of the slide, let's talk about those who have involvement with the correctional system. When someone is in the correctional system, the care that they receive can be compromised. And after leaving the system, the occupational discrimination takes place. If you've ever had a felony on your record, whether it was your fault or not, and whether you served your time or not, it's very hard to make that record go away. It's very hard to go on and get a job with that record, regardless of why you got that felony. Maybe you were one of these homeless people I'm talking about who had trouble with mental health or substance abuse. A lot of the people running around in society who are very clean cut today have that in their past. And so if you can get over the occupational discrimination and get back into the workforce after having a felony or correctional involvement, that's wonderful. But most of the time, that's difficult. And of course, mental health and substance abuse issues are prevalent in the correctional population. Often it's those things that help get them into jail. Correctional status intersects with homelessness and intersects with being uninsured in these enabling characteristics. You can imagine how someone with schizophrenia or, or bipolar disorder who doesn't have insurance and therefore doesn't get treatment goes into states where they are likely to damage property or assault people, which is illegal and thus they enter the correctional system. And there we go. How could medical technology cost effectively improve access to quality care in these groups? When we have the uninsured people, we have nobody paying. Right now, they are going for ER visits. Is there a way we can make these ER visits for these uninsured less expensive? 
Maybe we can use some of that decision support. Maybe we can look at who in the uninsured population is actually going to the ER. Can we make ER insurance? Let's look at access and let's look at cost. Our homeless population. Can we just give them mental health treatment and help them ascend from homelessness? Remember, homeless people can be very good with technology. A lot of them live off of smartphones. A lot of them know how to access the public library and that technology that's available there. If technology is made available to them, maybe they will use it for health purposes. Migrant workers maybe can use technology for continuity of care. Like I said, migrant workers, just because they're migrant workers and maybe don't have a lot of computer technology at home, doesn't mean that they're not savvy. A lot of them do a lot with their cell phones. And so, is there a way to get continuity of care through that interface? Is there a way to help keep them anonymous while giving them care so they feel protected if they are undocumented? Is there a way to keep it up? And finally, in our correctional population, which unfortunately intersects with our homeless population, is there a way to deliver mental health and substance abuse treatment by way of technology and maybe even increasing the privacy, as I mentioned, with rural people? Now let's finally move on to the last set of vulnerability characteristics, which are need characteristics. Let's start with one called mental illness. If you have a mental illness, you have a need characteristic, and that's just pretty important to address. It's not going to go away on its own. In fact, it rates second as a nationwide burden on not only health, but productivity. In the United States, look at that. Over 25% of U.S. adults have at least one mental illness per year. About one-fifth of those have severe mental illness. And only 41% of those with a mental illness get any treatment. For example, in 2006, 36 million people received $57 billion of mental health services. Now this is on an average of around $1,500 per person. And that is while 41% of those with a mental illness are not, are, are the only ones getting treatment. And so around 60% are not. And still we're spending all this money. And of course, mental illness, it's hard enough to suffer with that. But that can lead to chronic illness and disability. Chronic illness and disability affects almost half of all Americans because they have at least one chronic condition. And chronic conditions can really lead to disability. Chronic disease deaths are largely attributed to preventable illnesses. If you think about anybody who has died of a disease, was it a sudden thing? Was it an accident? It would be really much better if a sudden disease comes or a sudden bad thing comes and takes a loved one away. We don't like to watch them become debilitated from a chronic disease, and so many of them could be prevented. Like anybody who smokes and who's listening to this, quitting smoking will prevent fill in the blank. U.S. healthcare system, though, is oriented towards treating acute illness. So as you can see, even though smoking, cutting out smoking tobacco will prevent all the chronic conditions Basically, you can just fill in the blank. The U.S. healthcare system doesn't really have much in the way of smoking cessation services. How could these be delivered by using telehealth or medical technology? We already see some obvious applications. Another need characteristic that is mentioned is HIV and AIDS. One million adolescents and adults are living with HIV in the US and that's a lot of work now. HIV is a chronic disease but it doesn't have to be an immediately harrowing death sentences. More Americans now know their status because of advances in diagnosis and advances in treatments have slowed incidence and increased prevalence meaning fewer people are getting infected and the people who are infected are living longer. Antiretroviral therapy costs unfortunately 
$15,000 a year. And cost can be a barrier. So people living with HIV have to deal with this barrier. So again, we see an overlap with predisposing and enabling characteristics with this need characteristics of HIV and AIDS. How could medical technology be used cost effectively to improve access to quality care in these groups? We talked about mental illness patients. We talked about how if you access it from home, you can reduce privacy and stigma and maybe even reduce costs and improve access. Chronic illness patients often have a lot of trouble just simply going places, getting transport, especially if they're using assistive devices or wheelchairs. Is there a way to do remote monitoring? Send them home with devices that are hooked up to the computer that send information to their caregivers at a distance. Is there a way to help over even the telephone to with secondary and tertiary prevention, which is basically, is there a way to make their chronic illness not go so badly? And again, think about the HIV patients. A lot of them could benefit from home health and home health could benefit from even more information technology. And again, we have to think when we come to HIV patients about privacy and stigma and ways that information technology and health care and medical technology can be used to reduce that. In conclusion, the U.S., like every country, has its own unique vulnerable populations but in our country, they're covered by a safety net. And so really, we have to think of better ways to use our information and medical technology to cover them. These vulnerable populations in the U.S. can be looked at as having predisposing, enabling, and need characteristics. We discussed specific ones, such as racial minorities, children and women, rural residents, homeless, the mentally ill, and individuals living with HIV and AIDS. An important concern for the future, again, with, as I harp on, Healthy People 2020, are healthcare disparities. Not only disparities in access, but in disparities in quality of care. And think about the Affordable Care Act provisions, which are, not, which are now expanding care to more people. How can technology be applied to make things better and not worse? Now that we have reached the end of both parts of this lecture, you should be able to explain at least two ways in which technology can be used to improve access to care for a special population. Describe at least three considerations that should be taken into account when trying to minimize the cost and maximize the benefit of medical technology. And finally, describe at least one special population, what special needs it has, and what the health care system must consider in meeting those needs. Now that you've reached the end of this lecture, hopefully you better understand technology and its effects in the U.S. healthcare system. And you also hopefully better understand the needs of special populations. And I hope you see in your mind win-win situations where you could apply technology to the access problems of these special populations and get success. Hopefully, you don't see greedy ways of bankrupting the U.S. government by selling them crappy technology that doesn't work and help anybody. And hopefully, you don't see a way of bankrupting everybody so that we can't pay for access for these special populations so they can't even get health care. So hopefully, that's not what you saw. Now, we will move on to Chapter 6, which is about money, money, money.